chemise by Kay Ryan. What would the self disrobed look like? The form undraped? There's a flimsy cloth we can't take off, some last chemise we can't escape, a hope more intimate than paint to please. A hope to please, we all wear it. We're all appareled in a longing to be seen, to be recognized, valued for who we are, who we strive to be. Nobody wants to be invisible. This elemental human desire to matter to others highlights both the origin and the existential importance of collaboration, which is, of course, our theme here at the Aspen Action Forum this week. But when we speak of collaboration, we often talk about the outcomes or the process. But this tactical approach may miss aspects that cannot be quantified, but tie to what is most vital about the chain of human experience across time, space, and circumstance. Before we can practice collaboration, I believe we have to bring it into our hearts. What does that mean? I'll stand on the shoulders of my greatest collaborators, more poets, to illustrate this point. D.H. Lawrence called out, what is the knocking at the door in the night? Is it someone wants to do us harm? No, no, it is the three strange angels. Admit them, admit them. Decades later, Bob Dylan responded. Three angels up on high, each one playing a horn, and the angels playing their horns all day as the whole earth in progression seems to pass by. But does anyone hear the music they play? Does anybody even try? So that's a dialogue between Lawrence and Dylan. But the real question is, how will we respond? Do we admit angels? Are we listening for music that would be lost without our collaborating and becoming involved? I'd like to respond, I guess maybe it's an action pledge, with a collaborative act um, together to preserve something of value. I, um, I wrote a blog a couple of, couple of months ago and referred to uh, a forgotten poet, Radcliffe Squires, and in wanting to link in this blog to him, I realized he basically didn't exist in the interwebs uh, when I Googled him. Uh, there's only one copy left of his finest collection on the used bookstore section of Amazon.com. And I began to think about the tragedy of losing this incredible voice in future generations not being exposed to the beauty that he created. So I collaborated with two great friends uh, with the support and help of Dana Joya, poet, essayist, former chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, and my friend Niccolo Deliantoni who is um, a fan of Lupe Fiasco and uh, heading to Boulder in a couple of weeks to start his freshman year in college. We built a Wikipedia page for Radcliffe Squires. And with your indulgence, I'd like to add some content to that because Aspen is kind enough to film this. Uh, when I read his very great poem, A Day in Salamanca, there will be an archival record that I can put on the Wikipedia page uh, and we'll save his words for all posterity. This poem in particular, uh, I think, is an important one to share today because it celebrates the music that people create when they reach across differences to see each other as worthy collaborators in the venture we call life, to see strangers as angels. A Day in Salamanca by Radcliffe Squires. Across the square, the late sun angles down through arches in golden cones against the violet shop windows. At a table, a beautiful priest smiles at his expensive dessert. At another table, students, old looking in their dark suits, talk erotically of revolution. Then priest and students turn towards me with the squint of conspirators, while a boy 
leaning into the slanted sunlight as though it were wind, comes slowly across the immense square, tacking into the light. Until he stands at my table, his big wrists glow six inches beyond the scarecrow sleeves. As he holds a sparrow towards me and chants, what shall it be, freedom or blood sacrifice? The bird peers from the noose of thumb and forefinger, tightening to show the way of sacrifice. I laugh. The boy scowls, his lips curl back from wet teeth. He pushes nearer. A windowless smell of cooking oil comes from his clothes, but beneath that, faintly, the neutral perfume of all humanity. The smell, I think, of wheat fields, motionless in sunlight. I lean back, shrug, and say, he does not have the courage to kill the bird. The insult brings the moment we have all been waiting for. The priest titters, the students freeze, the boy's face pressing nearer, blots out the square with its false sunset, whispering, libertad o sacrificio. And I drop the coin on the enameled table. The bird spurts away, but not far. On a window ledge it waits, trying us with one eye and then the other. And when the boy whistles, it comes to his hand. From under his jacket, he takes the small cage filigreed from pale, clean wood, a Moorish bower where the bird enters, a spoiled princess. The priest and the students bored now turn away, but the boy and I smile at each other, not decently nor gratefully, but with a certain love. Each day now for a week, I have bought this same bird's life from this same boy at this same table. Why not? The century being the century it is, the role is a role worth perfecting. Thank you. <laughs>